I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. It's June 1942. I'm speaking with Graham Farmella, who tells the detailed, melodramatic, unknown to mine ears story of how Great Britain's physicists and their genius in the 1920s and 30s created the conditions that were possible for the Americans with their cash and the fact that they were outside of the reach of the Hitlerite bombs and were not overwhelmed with starvation and all the problems of fighting uh, the, uh, as a fortress against the Hitlerites in the 1940s, how the Americans overtook the British bomb, and that has profound consequences following the war. Graham, June 20th, 1942. Harry Hopkins in attendance. The heat is wilting. These are mo- notes from your wonderful book, Graham. FDR uh, does not dictate a memo. All we know is what Harry Hopkins tells us, I guess. He and Churchill are meeting, and they're meeting about the tube alloys. What are the tube alloys, and what is decided that day to our understanding? Well, tube alloys was just the code name for the uh, for the British uh, project. That was all. The Americans had a uh, had a different code name for their project. And what uh, D- Churchill uh, knew that uh, that the that the, uh, the, the work between the British and American scientists needed p- to be regularised, so to speak. And uh, he met, as you vividly described there, uh, with. Uh, Roosevelt and Harry Hopkins and they thought, at least Churchill thought, that they had a way of working together that would uh, would give Britain a decent slice of the uh, of the action so to speak, but it did not turn out that way. Uh, we believe that Churchill, belie- uh, Churchill heard Roosevelt say we'll collaborate, we'll share. Yep. We believe Roosevelt told him that, is that correct? But they didn't yep. write anything down. Yeah. Well, Roosevelt was a very, very canny politician. You'll know better than I do. Uh, and he loved to keep things not, you know, uh, really quite, what's the word, uh, fluid, so that they could be interpreted uh, at a later date in ways that, would be, uh, that he would approve of. Uh, Ch- Churchill found this a bit maddening uh, and, and constantly was striving to, uh, to pin FDR down. But he certainly didn't do it in, those, in that instance. Yes, this is June of 42 now, and it's after the Battle of Midway, mm. so that both men can imagine their, their Europe first strategy will be successful. They can hold Japan uh, and they can proceed in Europe. But, and something uh, we've, I've, I've not been correct about asking for now, Graham, mm. early on, they were driven by the fear of the Germans building the bomb first. That was, er, that was in everyone's mind. Yep. Did they still have it in 42? Yes. Most definitely. I've spoken to American scientists, actually. uh, Some of them have passed away now, sadly, but uh, who were actually working on that project. And they they stressed to me repeatedly uh, just how frightened they were as citizens uh, and and scientists that their brilliant colleagues working uh, in Germany would get that bomb first. Uh, This is 42 now, and Enrico Fermi, remember, he was visited at Columbia University by Leo Szilard, who tells him, I'm frustrated, we can do this, let's talk about nuclear fission. Mm. They've now moved to uh, building their own, by hand, out of graphite blocks, nuclear reactor in Chicago by the university's Stagfield Stadium. It's wintertime, and a man named Ackers goes and visits them. Who's Ackers? Right. Uh, 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 Akers is the head of the uh, of the um, uh, British mission out there. He was the person who was uh, uh, running uh, tube alloys in, in effect. He, used to be, he was formerly an ICI employee. Americans were very, very concerned that as someone who was a, a come, came out of industry, that he would be reaping the benefits of all this for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the benefit of ICI. So they always looked at him rather askance. He was in Chicago shortly before the great achievement that you were building up to there, where Enrico Fermi, also a, f- a former enemy alien... This is December uh, 42. Go ahead, Graham. That's right, December the 2nd. Uh, and what they did was they built the first nuclear reactor, the first working nuclear reactor. In other words, they set up the first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction, right, which demonstrated quite clearly 
in a dish, uh, you know, in, under the under the uh, um, seats of a disused squash court in, uh, in in Chicago, that you could in fact get a nuclear reaction to go. That's not the same thing as building a bomb. It has to be said, but the nuclear chain reaction was viable. Well, it was all theory until they did this, and they did it with uh, with control rods, graphite rods, yeah. and you paint a scene that I'm thinking to myself, oh, is that how they did it? So a uh, Fermi declares the reaction is self-sustaining. He says, "Put the rods back in," not quite knowing what a meltdown would be like. I mean, they're, they're standing around drinking tea, mm. watching what would have we know now is an extremely dangerous mm. experiment. Uh, Tillard is present as, w- uh, as he well. Was. He was. This is now the Manhattan Project. That's what the Americans call it. Yep. And it's turned over to the military, a man named Leslie Groves. What do we need to know about him and how, and how he regarded the British uh, contributions? Well, he, uh, he bit, just built the Pentagon, a real butt-kicking CEO, absolutely brilliant at getting things done. Uh, and uh, if, for our purposes, one of the things that characterized him, he was a marked anglophobe. Uh, he uh, he very much saw this this project as something that was an all American venture, and he was brutally um, uh, uh, brutally realistic. It, that's, perhaps that's not the right word, but he, he he wanted he would use British scientists, but only when he couldn't get uh, American expertise uh, or uh, that was that was comparable. To your knowledge, Graham, did he know about the origin of the theories that Fermi and Szilard are applying and? In Chicago, oh, yeah. did he understand that this was from uh, Birmingham and from Chadwick and from? Yeah. he knew yeah. all that, and oh, he, yeah. and he, he was, was willing, extremely, but because extremely it's, well briefed, and of course he'd appointed by this time he'd appointed appointed Oppenheimer, who was a first rate uh, theoretical physicist. Uh, so uh, there was all manner of conversation. So they knew where that stuff came from. So Britain had had many of the early ideas, not all of them, but most uh, most of them, I think it's fair to say. But uh, what they didn't have was uh, was the uh, w- with the resources, and uh, and they were of course under under. Uh, well, that's okay, but I mean the, well. the British didn't have the resources. But in fact, this was a collaborative effort to fight the Br- the Germans and. Oh the, yeah. the, So it seems to me kind of well. In any event, I don't want to do the lawyer work here. But in any event, what I see is Leslie Grove found an excuse to block the British out, and that was ICI. Why? Did, what did he say about ICI? What was his concern? Well, he was concerned that the British, uh, uh, that, the, that the ICI would walk away with technical know-how that Americans had uh, had paid for, paid for it, uh, and use it to set up a civil nuclear but, power. But if you were Britain. taking a patent out, Graham, did anybody ever talk about this in front of you? I mean, these physicists all these years later, if you were patenting fission, the British would have owned the patent. America could have leased it, but the the well, you know how patent law works today. Oh yeah, no, that's right. It, 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 particularly, it was French colleagues. French were uh, uh, our fr- our French friends were were probably the leaders when the uh, uh, f- of this type of nuclear experiment when the war broke out, and they were constantly striving to patent uh, their their work. And uh, Gross had absolutely no time for that at all. And I must say, Churchill didn't either. Um, so uh, really, Gross was 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 someone who really. Really, uh, was uh, was absolutely determined, like the first-rate CEO that he was, in terms of he he knew that he had to produce a a deliverable nuclear weapon, right? And that's what he did. He and he was not going to be distracted from that. Right. This is 1942 now, from, Late 42, from uh, yeah. uh, December 42. Now, the, what they've been told is that they have to build. Uh, an enormous industrial base, 40 yep. acres is the estimate, and that it will cost like five million pounds a week or some incredible number. Yeah, it incredible. eventually costs billions. Mm. However, they don't have the space in Britain. And the debate was, shall we build it in Britain? Shall we build it in Canada? Or shall we build it in America? At this point, uh, uh, Grove says we're going to build it here. And we know now it's Los Alamos, it's yeah. Oak Ridge, and it's Hanford. They build yep. three sites. Mm. We need to flag here, before we go any longer, the plutonium bomb. Mm. The plutonium bomb is a separate track from the uranium bomb. Who, yep. who imagines the plutonium bomb and the implosion? Well, that, that, uh, that uh, it, 
Chadwick uh, did, had fought independently of a plutonium weapon, but uh, by far the most important work came from the Americans, from, from Lawrence and Co. Uh, in, in California. So I think it's fair to say that the plutonium side of the story was... Uh, was and, and that's the Hanford facility will do the plutonium work, whereas Oak Ridge is going to do the, that's right. uh, the uh, work with U-235. So yep. we ha- and Los Alamos is where Grove sets up the camp for all the scientists. And now we're going to turn to Churchill. Remember, this is Churchill's bomb. What did he make of this fact that the Americans were overtaking the bomb that started out as collaboration? Graham Farmello is the author. Churchill's bomb is, is the name of the book, How the United States Overtook Britain in the First Nuclear Arms Race. It's now 1943 when we come back. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. I'm speaking with Graham Farmello, who's done prodigious research to assemble and write romantically the story of this war in the backdrop. The Second World War is in the backdrop of the story of Churchill's bomb. What the men, the physicists, the scientists, the military men, even the pilots flying them back and forth, they weren't following what I'd say was a uh, careful secret hygiene at this point because people were talking all the time. You know, physicists, when they come together, they have tea, they uh, they light up their pipes and they start speculating. In any event, uh, Leslie Groves, general, is now in command of building the gadget for the war, or is it? Graham, at this point, it's 43. Churchill's aware, or he's been briefed at this point, that the Americans are going in a direction to build a bomb for themselves or for Great Britain? How does he tell himself? Because he's going to meet Roosevelt again and again uh, through 43. What do he and Roosevelt believe is going on? Well, uh, first of all, Roosevelt had the thing delegated, right? Uh, and and he, uh, he had a first-rate team. Uh, that, and I don't, I don't think we need to be detained by that because uh, everything was going swimmingly from their point of view. From Churchill's point of view, I think that, uh, that uh, it's it accurate to say that uh, Churchill took his eye off the ball here. He took virtually no initiatives at all. And he, when he found in the early months of 1943 that uh, Harry Hopkins, whom he liked, uh, was basically uh, what we would now say is not returning his calls. He was not playing ball in such a way that the, the project would, 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 uh, would be a, a collaboration as Churchill thought it would be. And he got very, very frustrated with this until in April 1943, this is critical, uh, I've been very carefully through the archives here, you can see Churchill's patience snap in that month and he then becomes the prime minister that uh, that we uh, who, who uh, that of of the type we uh, that we revere now of somebody who takes the bull by the horns and he uh, commissions reports he lindemann writes excellent stuff on on the bomb he uh, sends he, in lindemann he sends lindemann to to find out what's going on he does he does uh, but but churchill was was extremely concerned that uh, that uh, Britain was uh, was was being sidelined. The British, British project was was very very weak at that time, and uh, the, the British had been virtually shut out of the American project. Something that was that uh, was, uh, was was seen as egregious inside the the, uh, the British scientific ranks. And let's very uh, let's do the Lin- the Lindemann meeting with Bush. I can imagine. What, I wish we had YouTube's of all this, Graham. <laughs> really, uh, all of a sudden Lindemann shows up. Remember, Lindemann is accepted even by English standards. Okay, fine. <laughs> I, I, I imagine him listening to opera in his uh, hot 104-degree bath, six inches of water only. Isn't that Lindemann who does that? Yes. Yep. And at, at his remade rooms at, at Christ Church, uh, driving, being driven everywhere by Harvey, his chauffeur, in his Rolls Royce. He comes to America. He asks, what's going on? Mm. And Lindemann says... Where where is the cooperation? And Bush does Bush lie to him? Does he, does he mislead him? What is it? What does Bush do for Lindemann's direct questions? 
Well, uh, I, I think strung him along is the term I would use. Um, I, I think it's accurate to say that, uh, that, that Bush and Connell played a very neat game from their point of view. Uh, and with, I'd say, with, as far as I could see, with the collaboration of, uh, of Roosevelt, uh, uh, who, who, who was never, it was always difficult to see what FDR really thought because he had so many different views on things and he was, he was the classic juggler. Um, but it was only in August 1943 that Churchill pinned... Uh, Roosevelt down with a uh, an agreement. Right, that- here, let's go through the agreement. The bomb would be built as a joint venture. Neither country would use the weapon against uh, the other. It. Neither would pass information to other countries. Good yep. heavens, they've <laughs> just... Okay, that was between the Prime Minister and the President. Did they write it down? Uh, yes, it was written down by their officials. It had been hammered out in Washington uh, shortly before, but it, it was signed at a brief, uh, I think it was a ceremony, but it was signed very briefly uh, in, in the wings, so to speak, of the uh, Quebec conference in August 1943. That's the Quebec agreement that they kept secret. Yeah, oh, it, that was, and that I might. That this is a big part of the story, John, because neither uh, neither Churchill nor uh, Roosevelt told their deputies about this. Both their deputies were kept almost completely in the dark about this. They treated this is Churchill and Roosevelt the the, the, the nuclear project as a kind of personal fiefdom. You know, it was their thing. They saw it as something that they would work out, and you know, and and uh, uh, and and their and governments and what have you could uh, you know could could go their own sweet way and neat and bother themselves about it. Uh, there is a garbled cable from the president written to Bush, who was in London after this. Mm. And uh, apparently the garble was very convenient to the White House. I wonder if it was on purpose. Instead of saying that they'd renewed their agreement, oh. it said they'd reviewed their agreement. Do we believe that was done on purpose or was that I, a genuine accident? I, I, but my own view, it was an accident. But it was, it was yeah, I, I, honestly, I think it illustrates the... Chaos is too strong, but you know it was such a such a <laughs> such a mess. It was almost like a fado farce, you know. Uh, it, uh, but the the main thing was that the the uh, that Bush uh, and O'Connor were determined that Churchill was not going to bully, so to speak, his way into what they saw as as fundamentally an American run project. Did Churchill recognize at this time, Graham, that the Americans had switched from winning the war against Germany to dominating the world? Because that's a question you ask. Do do we have evidence that Roosevelt had talked to anybody about if we have this weapon, we win everything? I don't think that was true at that stage. I think that came a, a good deal later when the Secretary of War Stimson was using the language that you've just used there. But that Henry was a good Stimson, deal later. the Secretary of War, he was very much against the British participating in these in this collaboration. Right? Mm-hmm. He wanted the bomb for America because America was going to save the world. Did Roosevelt sign on to that before be any time? Do we have a document? I, 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 I hesitate. I don't know for certain. I don't believe he did, but I wouldn't like to say definitively. Uh, that was Roosevelt's way, wasn't it, Graham? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but I'm just later. being honest. I don't know for sure about that. All right. I, I know I, it's a good place to hesitate because we're about to reintroduce a hero. His name is Niels Bohr. He's going to escape from Denmark and make his way to Great Britain to meet with the prime minister. They call him the Great Dane. Bohr and Churchill in a room together. Imagine that. Churchill's Bomb is the book. How the United States overtook Britain in the first nuclear arms race. Graham Farmello is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batchelor, this is the John Batchelor Show. Graham Farmello is here, and we're speaking of his extremely comprehensive st- storytelling about over 20, 30, 40 years, the thinking about and the politics of the atomic bomb. First, the fission bomb, uh, the ut- what becomes the uranium bomb that's dropped at Hiroshima, and then the plutonium bomb that's dropped at Nagasaki. It's these men and their political contest that shape not only the end of the first of the second war, but also the post-war world. And we're still living with it because they dream of international nuclear weapons control. 
something we struggle with in the 21st century. All those thoughts, all those fears are here in Graham's book. Graham, we go to uh, Lindemann. He wants a British bomb. This is now is he's he's Sir Charwell by now. Uh, I love one of his uh, critics saying Charwell, it's a muddy little stream. They struggled with Lindemann, but he had the ear of the prime minister whom you correctly say at this point in his life was ruling not only Great Britain, but the world as a monarch. He carried on with no checks and balances, as we understand in American governance. Lindemann wanted Great Britain to build a bomb. Where? Did he want him to build it in Britain, in Canada? Did he want him to take possession of a bomb in America? How did he imagine it? Well, he was quite happy with the American, uh, Americans uh, running the Manhattan Project, but uh, it's quite clear that he thought that they would bring back with them the know-how from that project so that the British could then build their own weapons after the war. All right, so Lindemann always kept up that we're, we're, te- we're part of this. And yes. as he accepts the, what you'd have to say, uh, diplomatic turns of phrases that Roosevelt and Bush were using to say you're cooperating in this. Let's go off to site Y, because uh, you have a scene where the... Uh, Oppenheimer welcomes Niels Bohr to site Y. First of all, what is Niels Bohr to everybody at this point when he escapes from Europe? Niels Bohr was seen as the greatest nuclear physicist in the world and a, uh, and a deeply good and wise and kind man. All of those things. So you're looking at a real giant here, somebody who would rank uh, uh, almost alongside Einstein, maybe not as great, in fact, not as great as uh, a physicist, but a a deeply humane and thoughtful uh, thoughtful person. When he uh, escaped with his family from Copenhagen, he, uh, he was flown into London and was absolutely shocked to see that this weapon that he had thought as inconceivable at the beginning of the war was well on the way to being made and uh, he saw the terrible state of the British project uh, in, in, uh, in, in London and universities around the UK but then quickly headed off to the States to right. see he and his son travel as, as uh, under a pseudonym Baker and they go right to New York That's and right. they're taken to uh, site Y where is that what is that Right, it's uh, Los Alamos in uh, New Mexico, which is, uh, which, as we've said, it was the uh, scientific uh, re- research center of the Manhattan Project. Over, uh, and, and the boss was, was uh, by, by almost all, uh, all accounts, doing a superb job, and this was uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who uh, regarded Bohr as a kind of demigod. Uh, in the words of one of Oppenheimer's uh, uh, colleagues. And the real shock was that... Uh, that Bohr, one of his first things that he said to uh, to Oppenheimer was, is this bomb going to be big enough? Now, what he was thinking there was he was thinking of a world where you had weapons that were so powerful you couldn't use them. Because uh, uh, he, he, because if uh, it was like the, uh, an analogy that uh, that um, uh, that Oppenheimer coined later about two scorpions in a bottle that neither would dare to strike first. What upset uh, Bohr... Uh, and he was the first person, it seems, who really saw this clearly, although there were many, many brilliant people, scientists and indeed politicians, or a few politicians around uh, F- FDR and Churchill. But what Bohr saw was that it was a very dangerous situation uh, where you weren't thinking about nuclear controls, no thinking about nuclear weapons after the war, and in particular that the British and American allies, the people that were doing most of the dying, which was the Soviet Union, had been shut out of this project. And he thought this would be terrible after the war and that uh, this cocktail would give rise to a terrible arms race and a gross, grotesque um, uh, uh, problem of mistrust after the war had been uh, completed. Uh, Bohr returns to Great Britain and he he is uh, ushered into the presence of the prime minister. He's been mm-hmm. prepared for this. He mumbles a lot. Mm-hmm. And Churchill comes in and the meeting goes terribly. What yep. did Bohr want to tell Churchill? What did Churchill make of him? What Bohr wanted to, uh, to, t- uh, to, uh, to tell Churchill was uh, that he believed that it was important that the... Uh, that the uh, Soviets were at least uh, uh, 
told about the existence of this of this project and that uh, the allies america and britain should start thinking in a forward way about uh, the uh, control uh, of nuclear weapons and, uh, and, and and minerals that make them possible after the war so he was thinking way way ahead uh, and in particular of briefing the the soviets not not bringing Soviet scientists into the project, but at least telling them that the, the, the bomb was being, was being made. And Churchill wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, as Paul said later, that he and Lindemann were treated like schoolboys. Graham Farmello, the book is Churchill's Bomb, How the United States Overtook Britain in the, nuclear, in the First Nuclear Arms Race. The bomb is under construction. We've already seen the bomb in 1945. Mm. It's important now... What happens after the war? And when we come back, very quickly, watch how the United States takes complete control of the atomic weapons. I'm John Batchelor. This- I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Graham Farmello's here, and we've set up what you see at the beginning, which is July 16th, 1945, the Trinity Test being witnessed by Oppenheimer and Groves the, uh, for the Americans in Connet, but for the British, Chadwick, the man who discovers the neutron back in 1932 and wins the Nobel Prize for it. The word goes back to Great Britain at this, and not only Great Britain, but on the Potsdam Conference where Truman, Roosevelt is dead in April of 45, is meeting with uh, Churchill, whom we know now has been defeated at the polls, but they haven't revealed the evidence. They won't reveal the results until later in July. This is mid-July and Stalin. Graham, a couple of important things. Churchill and Roosevelt decided not to tell Stalin. Uh, And at this point, Stalin, we know now, knows because of his spies. Why didn't they tell Stalin about the bomb? Well, for, for, first of all, they, they are, uh, Americans and British both believed that they had done a successful job of keeping out the Soviet spies, and that, that was uh, completely fanciful. The Soviet spies had uh, penetrated deep into the Manhattan Project, and earlier they had gone deep into the into Whitehall. Uh, so Stalin and his colleagues had the Maud report, they had the Quebec report days after these things had been filed. So, uh, so the, 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 the Soviets knew pretty much all about uh, the, the bomb project. But, but Churchill so they, and Truman didn't know that. No, they certainly did not know that. Uh, and uh, after one of the sessions, Truman uh, mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the, the bomb pro- uh, to, to Stalin. And I think it's fair to stay, say that, uh, that uh, Stalin um, uh, fooled b- b- uh, both Right. The, the president and the prime minister. It was a Gilbert thinking. and Sullivan moment, Graham. I mean, you know, he rolled his eyes and acted surprised. We know. He did. Yes, we know now. Now, they didn't tell him, Churchill and Roosevelt didn't tell him in 41, 42, 43, when he was their ally. Why? Well, they certainly, I can certainly speak for Churchill that he fundamentally uh, mistrusted right. the, uh, the the the, so, uh, the the idea of the Soviets having a weapon like that after the war. He thought he could work with with Stalin, and that was some, one of his biggest errors, in my opinion. Um, but he certainly did n- did not want them to have that advantage that the Americans and, and, and he thought. The All British right, would quickly have. now, the Americans and the British have worked together. The war is over. Truman's mm. in the White. House, and it's now August of 1946, a year after the bomb is used against the Japanese, mm. and suddenly a law is passed in the United States. It's called the McMahon Act. That's right. And what does it say, and how does it treat the British? Well, it, 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 it forbids Americans from working on atomic secrets with, with any other uh, people from any other country at all, including Britain who, of course, had contributed much to the, uh, to, to, to the Manhattan Project in getting uh, the uh, know-how from the Maud Report and, and, and elsewhere. So the British uh, scientists in particular, and the British government as well, were, were, I think, mortified is the right term, by the way they'd been excluded after the war. And because of that, the British go ahead in 48, is my note here, to build yep. their own bomb. That's Attlee. He's, is he prime minister at that point, Attlee? That's right. That's right. And his foreign secretary, Bevin, was, was the person that was urging this. But in the end, they said, well, to hell with this. We're going ha- to have to do it on our own. And Britain then was in the uh, humiliating, I think, position of 
uh, of, uh, of of basically t- taking what they could remember from the uh, from Los Alamos and from the uh, from the uh, from the Manhattan Project and bringing that stuff and and uh, and reinventing the bomb, so to speak. And that's what the, that's what the British scientists were, t- were tasked with doing under Atlee's government. Uh, again, this is a product of the fact that Roosevelt didn't write anything down, that the Quebec Agreement was kept secret, and yep. that Churchill didn't write anything down, and yep. that men like Bush and Grove were, were successful and Hopkins were successful and fooling the British to believe that they were collaborating when in fact they were, they were being cut out and that made the McMahon Max very easy to pass because they could elbow aside people who had already been kept well in the backdrop. That's right. And, it, and of course, it came at a time when there was deep, deep suspicion. This is the, uh, of, of, the of the Soviets, you know, the, the beginning of the Cold War, uh, when America was very, very much turning in on oh, it. Uh, oh, let's go to February 1950. February 3rd, 1950. Remember Rudy per- Piles? Piles, Piles. Yeah. Rudy Piles was one of the men with Frisch at Birmingham who first imagined a U-235 bomb. Mm. He gets a phone call from... The Evening Standard, one of the great newspapers of Great Britain at the time, saying, are you where your friend uh, Fuchs has been arrested? Who is Fuchs? Fuchs was one of the scientists that Churchill, uh, Churchill's government sent out to the Manhattan Project and was a, was a very, very accomplished theoretical physicist. And he was also a, a Russian spy. Right, that's how Stalin knew. It was... <laughs> yeah, yeah he, well, he wasn't the only spy, incidentally, but right. he... Uh, but that, but but it was spies that made it possible for the Soviets to get the bomb at least two years sooner than even right the because Fuchs thought. he was a good physicist he knew what they were doing it wasn't just they're building a big bomb it was this is how they're doing it yeah that's right and that uh, so the, uh, the 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 Soviets had the last laugh and then pretty much as Bohr predicted. I mean, he may have been naive, he may have played his, uh, his cards uh, uh, unwisely, but uh, the arms race that he feared, that it started to, 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 to take off big time then. The uh, trial was held very quickly in the Old Bailey. March 1st is my note. Uh, Graham's book is filled with these scenes. And all of the British royalty and physics are there. They're all flabbergasted because they love Fuchs. They, mm. they admire him. He was a communist young. He will serve until 1959. He'll go back to East Germany. He'll be decorated and he'll live there the rest of his life. Mm. He says he was, what, controlled schizophrenia. That's his excuse. That, yeah. he, that he, he regrets what he's done. He's betrayed all of his friends. Yeah. Oh, it was unspeakable, and and uh, poor Rudy Piles never really got over it. To be perfectly honest, you know, this was someone he trusted like a, well, a brother, you could say. You know, it was a he really trusted Fuchs, and to look to to find out that this uh, that this uh, this great trusted friend had been taking these these secrets and passing them, you know, in uh, in, in uh, you know, in, into the Soviets was something that that uh, Piles thought was unconscionable. Rightly so, too. Back to Churchill. Uh, the prime minister falls from power. Attlee becomes uh, uh, the premier. However, Churchill returns to power in the 1950s. And there are scenes here where Churchill resents the fact that Eisenhower is now president of the United States, whom he regards as a talented underling, but mm. certainly not someone comparable uh, to Roosevelt, mm. whom the prime minister adored. The prime minister is now 80 years old, yep. and he knows that these are his last moments in power, and he wants to go out on a big speech. He is frightened of the H-bomb. Why? Well, he was, he was, he, he was utterly astonished at the power of uh, of that bomb, that it was so much more powerful than the bombs that obliterated uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, and he, in the climate of the Cold War, he was deeply fearful that such weapons might might be used. What I'm struck by is that at the end, the Prime Minister, and he lives a full life, he lives another 10 years after he leaves power, but in any event, at the end of his life, he was the man at the beginning, still imagining the future. He his, was. F- his 50 years hence speech, he cribs for his speech to Parliament in 19... What's that? 1955. Yeah, he's quoted it. That's uh, right. The, the, he's also a man who reads fiction. 
And I'm struck by the fact that it's Neville Shoots on the beach mm. that frightens him. He sends it to people. He, he takes the novel and sends it out. This is what, 58, 59, yeah. late, late in the decade. That's right. What does he make of that novel? Does he think that's the future? I, uh, we don't know that. We know he read the novel, and we know he was fascinated by nuclear physics. He did his first nuclear experiment when he was 80 years old, after he'd left office. Graham, the Prime Minister's full life and Churchill's bomb, is there any in- indication in his notes or his memoirs or people who remember talking to him that he regrets the atomic bomb, that he had doubts about what they, what they invented to beat Hitler that had been turned into a scourge for all the nations of the earth? No, I think... Uh, for, uh, I, I've looked at this very closely. I would say that he never... Uh, regretted dropping uh, the bomb, certainly not on Hiroshima. Uh, I, 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 it, you, he perhaps equivocated very slightly on uh, on uh, on the nag- on the second dropping of the second bomb, but certainly not in not in not in any public speech. Uh, Churchill was uh, was it would be very unusual for Ch- uh, for Churchill to actually say, well, I may you know I really screwed up, I made a big error here. He didn't he, he didn't do that kind of. Uh, 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 of modesty, and in in my uh, I- I judgment, he uh, he w- was w- w- uh, never fully recognised the I believe errors he made during the ha- uh, the Second World War in handling the, uh, the the bomb with his American friends. He was extremely loyal to the United States. Let's be clear about that. And as you rightly said earlier, he loved Roosevelt. He absolutely adored him as as, as a leader. But I, I don't think he knew how to handle a situation where, where, where the, the cards were so stacked in America's favor in, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the finances and resources that were, went to build the bomb. The book is Churchill's Bomb, How the United States Overtook Britain in the First Nuclear Arms Race. Graham Farmello begins his book with two quotes of particular irony. One from Mark Oliphant, the Australian who becomes critical in introducing the idea of the bomb to the United States. Mr. Oliphant wrote, 20 April 1940, Scientists on the whole are a very docile lot. Apart from their own particular job, they do just what they are told and are content to sit down and be very minor entities. And a second quote, this from Winston Churchill, dated 14 November 1937, before he became prime minister, before the disaster of the Second War. Mr. Churchill wrote, In the next 50 years, mankind will make greater progress in mastering and applying natural forces than in the last million years or more. And the first question we must ask ourselves is, are we fit for it? Are we worthy of all these exalted responsibilities? Can we bear this tremendous strain? Thanking Graham Farmello, I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.